Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. For those of you joining us for the first time today, I'm Ken DeLisa, and I serve as Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Eastern. I'm very happy to welcome you to the President's Leadership Awards Luncheon and to see so many good friends and colleagues in this uh, beautiful venue. For us, this luncheon really is one of the highlights of the year as we get to acknowledge and thank so many of you for your commitment to Eastern and to our students. Now, before we begin, and because we're a state uh, organization, uh, we are required to make this announcement. So in case of an emergency requiring evacuation, please note that there are exits on each end of the foyer here and down there. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the instructions of our campus police or the university officials. Thank you. As we have for nearly 50 years now, we come together to celebrate some very special members of the Eastern family as we recognize the important and positive impact of our alumni and donors. Because of your professional achievements, personal philanthropy, and unwavering commitment to Eastern, you inspire our passion for higher education. You serve as role models for our students, and you create opportunities for them to succeed. Looking out among you, I see the faces of our Eastern family and friends, including leadership donors, past award recipients, emeriti faculty, and friends who believe in creating opportunity and in making Eastern an even greater institution for the future. We are grateful for your friendship and generosity, and we are thankful that you are joining us today. Our campus has been kind of quiet this week. You might have noticed the lack of students because, as you know, they've been off enjoying their spring break. They'll return over the weekend, and by Monday, this place will be teeming with activity and as they begin their sprint to the end of the academic year in just about eight short weeks. In fact, on May 15th, more than 1,200 of our students will receive uh, their degrees at the Excel Center in Hartford and begin the next phase of their lives. Many of our graduates will go on to work with some of the best-known companies in the world, and others will pursue graduate degrees at the most prestigious, prestigious universities here in the United States and abroad. We're proud of them, and we're proud of what they're going to accomplish in their lives. To those of you who gave so generously to provide the opportunity for a four-year degree for so many students with unmet financial needs, thank you. You make this all possible. Today we will present awards for philanthropy and for professional achievement and service. At this time, I wish to thank the alumni volunteers serving on this year's awards selection committee, including Dr. Wendy Ernst, class of 1993, Ellen Lang, class of 1981, Joe Loeb, class of 2003, and Marlene Pichet, class of 1994. They take this role very seriously, and I am grateful for their thoughtful consideration and for their input. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues, Michael Stenko, Joe McGann, Pete Dane, John Beck, Ryan Rose, Donna Snell, and Cassidy Gallup for their combined efforts in making this event a nice experience for our guests today and for their commitment and support of Eastern's mission on a year-round basis. And of course, I'd like to recognize our past award recipients who are with us today. As I call your names, I would like to ask you to uh, please stand and remain standing, and I'll ask that the rest of us uh, hold our applause until I've recognized all the recipients. So uh, please stand as I call your name and please remain standing. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Abbott. Where's, where's Jackie? I thought I saw her. Okay, maybe she's not here. Uh, Anna Alfiero. Anna's here. Hi, Anna. Dr. Max Ferguson. I know Max is here. Oh, you're, you're leaving. Okay. We'll see you in a bit, Max. <laughs> Dr. Steve Kenton. Where's Steve? There he is. Hi, Steve. Uh, Father Larry LaPointe. James LaMonico. Uh, Mark Masinda, Dr. Charles Pruitt. I don't think I saw Dr. Pruitt come in. Oh, he's here. Yes, he is. He's over here. There he is. He'll be 100 years old this October. <laughs> Hans Weiss. Where's Hans? I know he's here. Oh, he's right here. There he is. And Dr. Carol Williams. Is Carol here? Yes, she is. She's right in front of me. Let's give them all a round of applause, and thank you for all being here. I'm also happy to share some great news with you about philanthropy at Eastern. For the fiscal year that ended on June 30th, total giving to the ECSU Foundation exceeded the $2 million mark for the sixth straight fiscal year, which has never happened before. And over the past four fiscal years, the ECSU Foundation scholarship awards have totaled $2.1 million including a record $645,000 during the last fiscal year. 
Um, this is incredible. The projection for scholarship awards this fiscal year is just shy of $700,000. So consider that this money will support more than 250 students with awards generally for three years. Um, this truly makes the difference as to whether these students are financially able to remain in school. What you do really makes a difference when you hear these numbers. Unlike private institutions, gifts to Eastern cannot be used for brick and mortar projects, but rather are restricted for academic scholarships, faculty initiatives, student clubs and organizations, and varsity athletics. As I mentioned, most of our scholarship awards assist students with financial need, and President Nunez will share some of their stories with you in her remarks. But please know that every gift made to Eastern touches our students in a meaningful and supportive way. We honor a special group of alumni and donors today, and like the honorees of past years, they share the belief in the power of higher education to transform lives, and through those lives, transform our world. With this with the support of outstanding alumni and friends like you, we will continue to give our students the tools they need to become critical thinkers and active participants of our democratic society. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our supreme cheerleader and devotee, the president of Eastern Connecticut State University, Dr. Elsa Nunez. Well, when I see this event on my calendar, I smile the week before and I keep the smile going because it is such a wonderful, wonderful event. I get to see people who love Eastern and, and it's just inspiring to be in the room with each of you because I know, I know how much you care about the university and the students who attend. But this event, you know, it, it looks great and you think the president did everything, right? And look how nice the tables look, but of course it's Ken DeLisa and his staff behind the scenes that work with the donors, that make the luncheon happen and that make all the details uh, work so that the room looks beautiful, that you feel welcome, and that it, the event is a success. Thank you, Kent, and to his staff for all that you do. I want to give a special shout out to Chartwells, our, our caterers here. They do all the food for the university, the student dinners, the student breakfast, lunches, and whatever events we have. And Camille is here with Chartwells and the wait staff, and I want to thank them for all they do too. So isn't this a gorgeous building? This is where the instruction happens for all the arts, the visual arts, the performing arts as well. Music is in this, uh, the, the studios are here for music, the studios are here for painting, for printmaking, uh, the theaters are here for performance. And it opened up two years ago, the building, uh, and it was at, uh, a really, really long, long haul for the faculty and the students to wait for it because we were down in Schaefer Hall and the facilities were not, not uh, adequate for teaching. And now we've seen an increase in majors. But the most important thing is that uh, when the students come touring to come to Eastern, they used to see an old, ugly building, you know, and who wants to be an art major or a theater major at Eastern? And now they come into this facility and they think, oh my God, this feels like a private, high elite institution. So I want to thank each of you. You're all taxpayers in Connecticut, most of you. And um, if you're not, move back to Connecticut and become a taxpayer. <laughs> but to the taxpayers of Connecticut, I say thank you because that's how these things happen. So thank you to all of you for giving us these wonderful facilities. So I've been here now 13 years and we've, you know, emphasized um, philanthropy and, you know, fundraising and that's part of my job as a uh, president. But the one area that Ken DeLisa really put his heart and soul with Joe McGann into that was the area of scholarships and it was the right place for them to put their energies. So over the last 12 years, we've added 52 new endowed scholarships. But guess, those 52 endowed scholarships total how much? 100,000, 200,000, a million? No, seven million dollars. Seven million dollars they've added to the scholarships. So we've doubled the number of donors making annual gifts of $1,000 or more. It used to be people would write us checks for $100 and we always try to get them to increase a little bit, but we've doubled the number of people giving us $1,000. That's really a wonderful thing. And the percentage of our alumni that give has increased. So you remember, if you've never been to a luncheon, you'll hear it for the first time, but if you've been to one of these lunches, you've, please allow me to repeat it, and that is, we are ranked very high in U.S. News and World Report. It goes from Canada 
all the way down to Maryland, across to Pennsylvania. That is the north. It is not the northeast. They break the country into four quadrants. We're in the north. We rank in the top public universities in the north, in the top 25 public universities in the north. That's incredible. If you think about it, it's a very saturated area of public of public universities and private universities, and we rank number among the top 25. And people always say, you know, Elsa, that's incredible, because if we were in the South, we'd probably be number two, because there are fewer universities and fewer colleges. So I don't know, I'm thinking of moving Eastern South and <laughs> to, get, to get the rankings higher. So US News and World Report looks at a lot of variables. They look at class size, faculty-student ratio, how many faculty, full-time faculty to students. They look at our infrastructure. They look at faculty salaries. They look at um, the support systems we have. And each variable, they give you a number. They throw all the numbers in a pool, and that's your, you know, that com composite number is uh, what drives your ranking. But one of the most important variables that's loaded, that means it's very heavily weighted, is what percentage of your alumni give. Now, they don't ask me how much does Carol give, how much does Sarah give, how much does Max give. They don't ask me. They just ask me, do your alumni give? And the theory behind it for US News and World Report, when we talk to them, is if you're so good at Eastern, why aren't your students giving when they leave, right? They should be grateful they got this great education. So the Harvard and Yales of the world have very high percentages, almost 90% of their students give after they graduate. And then the public struggle, and many of the private struggle, too, to get alumni to give. So when I came, the alumni giving rate was 3%. Not 13, not 30, 3% of people who graduated gave anything to Eastern, even a dollar. And so Ken and I worked for the last decade on this number. But think how hard it is, because the number is based on how many graduates you graduate every year. So even if Ken could convert 50% of the class into givers, he would still have a deficit, right? Because he can't convert it fast enough because of the numerator and the denominator. So what has happened at Eastern over time is that Ken DeLisa and his staff have taken that number from 3% to 9%. Now you think, well, that's not a lot. Yes, it is. When you think we graduate 1,000 people every year, he doesn't bring in 1,000 graduate donors every year. He can't, but he gets very close to the mark so that that number keeps going up. What's interesting about that 9% is that it's more than Sacred Heart University, more than Quinnipiac University, and more than the University of Hartford. I'm sorry, Sundeep, to say that, who's a colleague from the University of Hartford. They're private universities. So that means that Eastern has an alumni base now, based on Ken's work and his staff, that is uh, understanding the importance of alumni giving, and that's why that number has ticked up over a decade. I'm hoping that he can get it to over 10 before I die, because that's really important that we get it over 10. Two digits, I'm looking for two digits, but we're close. This year, Ken, maybe? Uh, <laughs> anyway, but the root of the, of the uh, uh, of, of, or the basis for all of the rankings is not just the rankings, because we, it is important, but it's not everything. It's that the variables in the ranking are, in, these variables are very important, and we pay attention to them. It is important for our alumni to give and to give back to other students who are here. It is important for us to have a good faculty uh, student ratio. It's good to have small class size. So I say to each of you in the room, thank you for all you've done to support Eastern and to support our students. I want to give a special thank you now to Justin Murphy. Justin is at the dais. Just, Justin, would you just wave your hand? He's class of 1998. He's the president of the foundation. And there is no better cheerleader for our university than Justin Murphy, who's an attorney, busy as hell, but always has time to support Eastern. This afternoon, we're going to have our award recipients receive their awards, and Ken was going to read all that they've done to support Eastern and all that they've done in their lifetimes. Eleanor McCants Katz is class of 1978. She's a national leader in mental health and addiction policy. She'll receive the Distinguished Alumni Award. A longtime volunteer, Mike Scallon. Mike, would you just wave? There's Mike. 
uh, will receive the Distinguished Service Award. Mike and his wife, we account Lorraine is at, as a, getting the award as well because that as a couple they do a lot of fundraising for Eastern and they do a lot of service, give a lot of service for Eastern. We also want to recognize this afternoon, although he can't be here, Rayo Bulliard, all of you know Rayo from the uh, Savings and uh, Institute and he is a friend of the university and will receive the Friend of the University Award. We have a great group of family members from the Spillane family honoring the philanthropy of Jerry uh, Shea, uh, Spillane, Jack Spillane, and Sean Spillane, and we're going to give them the Foundation's Distinguished Donor Award. And there's a picture of Buddy Spillane here at the table. We'll hold up in a minute. And Buddy was an education major here. He passed away, and his family's here, and we're honoring them for their generosity. And finally, I don't know where Eastern Connecticut would be without Eileen Oson. Eileen's foundation supports the hospital, supports Eastern, supports the soup kitchen. We don't have many foundations in Eastern Connecticut, and she is the most generous person I know, and we are so grateful to her for believing in this community and giving back over the years. So to all of you, I say congratulations, and it's an honor to have you here. I want to say a word about the money that you give for scholarships. You always think of the person that you give it to. We, we get the students to write you a letter to say thank you and to acknowledge receipt of the great gift you give them. So at the micro level, the individual contribution that you give is really important. We have Vanessa, who's a ward, ward of the state. When you're a ward of the state, it means that either your mother and father are dead and you become the state's the state becomes your guardian, or your parents are in jail or have committed a crime and they cannot take you in. And so the students who are here at Eastern as wards of the state generally spend the holidays here at, and when we break up for the holidays because they have nowhere to go. So your scholarships really make a difference in the life of students who come from those kinds of backgrounds where not for any fault of their own, they have nothing, nothing and your scholarship is a way in which they understand that there are people who care about them. We have Montage. Montage is here at Eastern. His family works with a little grocery store in uh, New London. The little grocery store has to support eight children. Montage is one of those eight children. He works in the grocery store, works here on campus, runs around all the time, and it's not enough what his father can give him so that he can attend college. The store doesn't produce enough revenue to support eight children eventually all going to college. Your scholarship helps Montage come here and work a few less hours in the grocery store and you know, fulfill the family dream, an immigrant family's dream to get the American dream. Billy is here, he's a junior. His father lost his job about two years ago very nice middle class, working class family. His father fell, lifting a refrigerator, hurt his back, lost his job. It was the end for the family. They can't support each other with what the mother makes. They got into debt. The house was, you know, repossessed, as they say, and the family lost everything. Billy depends on your scholarship to stay here. He, he feels that someday there'll be a way out for his family, and he's probably part of the answer. But your scholarship makes it possible for him to stay at Eastern and to say to his family, someday we won't be so bad off. That's at the micro level, at the individual level. That's how powerful your giving is. But what about at the macro level, at the highest level? You think about it, if a thousand people get a scholarship today, and they're in these categories, and I only mentioned three, you times that times I've been present in a decade, you know, this will be for decades to come that the endowed scholarships will be here. Eventually, you have hundreds of thousands of people benefiting from your generosity. So the scale of it is really important for you to think about because it's your donation matched to your donation matched to your donation, and the scale of it is what gives the greatest impact to our society. As president, when I say I'm president of Eastern Connecticut State University, the most important word in that is state. It's a public institution. It is really important, really important for me to share with you my passion for a state institution. That means that 
you don't have to come from a fancy family. You don't have to have the right last name like you did in Puerto Rico when I was a kid. I couldn't get into the, the major university because I didn't have the right connections. In so many countries around the world, the elite get in, the poor cannot. In this country, your mother can clean toilets and you can go to Harvard. It's a fantastic, fantastic idea of meritocracy. And so the public mission of Eastern is really important. It means as long as you work hard in high school, you earn the right to sit in that chair. And it doesn't matter what you have, what your family has, it's an equalizer. And that's what's so wonderful about your scholarship. You're giving to people from various backgrounds. Billy's white, this one's an immigrant, this one's black. It doesn't matter. They're all Americans and they're all worthy of your support. Because at the macro level, we do make a difference at Eastern. And through your philanthropic um, gestures and generosity, we're able to put these people into society when they graduate to pay taxes, go to church and you know, participate in their churches or in their civil activities in their communities. They get jobs, they become productive citizens, and that's what makes a great democracy. You cannot have a great democracy without a, a fulfilling the middle class dream, and that's what Eastern is about, and that's what your scholarships are all about. So today I ask you to think about your scholarship, not in terms of one person, but the impact that you make on all of society. So think of education in this way. Let us think of education as a means of de developing our greatest abilities, because in each of us there is a private hope and a private dream, which, when it is completely fulfilled, can be translated into a benefit for everyone and greater strength for this great nation. John Kennedy, 1961. Thank you. Folks, uh, please continue to enjoy your uh, dessert and coffee. I'm going to uh, move along with the program, but continue to enjoy the, the desserts. It looks really nice, and your coffee, and uh, we'll, we'll move on with the program. Um, of course, this is the, um, the best part of the program, uh, when we get to recognize our award recipients today. I will be joined as we do this, uh, as each recipient uh, is given their award, I'll be joined by President Nunez and Justin Murphy, uh, who is president of the ECSU Foundation Board of Directors, so they'll be helping me out when we take the pictures. So I'll start with our first award. Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz, class of 78, has advanced a career of extraordinary achievement in medicine, psychiatry, academic achievement, and public administration that has culminated in her appointment as Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse it, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's a federal appointment. Her appointment makes her the first assistant secretary level director of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. After earning a B.A. in biology from Eastern in 1978, she went on to earn a Ph.D. at Yale in infectious disease epidemiology in 1984 and then her M.D. from the University of Connecticut in 1987. She began medical school as she was finishing her PhD. <clears throat> After completing a residency in psychiatry, Dr. McCants Katz held teaching positions at the Yale School of Medicine, Brown, Virginia Commonwealth, UC San Francisco, the University of Texas, and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Prior to her HHS appointment, Dr. McCants Katz held several prominent positions, including Chief Medical Officer of the Rhode Island Department of Behavioral Health and of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, she was state medical director for the California Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs and medical director and chief operating officer of the, of the Virginia Health Practitioners Intervention Program. She has published numerous articles on clinical pharmacology and along with her husband Michael holds a patent for a method used to prevent specimen substitution in substance use screening. It was Connecticut's own Senator Chris Murphy who helped write the mental health bill that created the position that Dr. McCants Katz now holds. At the time of her confirmation, he said, quote, for the first time ever, a medical professional who is laser focused on addiction and mental health will be in the top echelon of health and human services. We created this, this position to elevate these important issues and improve coordination so that, so that people coping with a mental illness or substance abuse disorder can access the care and treatment they need, end quote. Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz is unable to be with us today as her role as Assistant Secretary uh, has her fully engaged in the oversight of multiple initiatives and legislation related to the prevention of opioid abuse that you know uh, very well uh, nowadays has become a national epidemic. 
We understand and appreciate Secretary McCants Katz's de dedication to her critically important duties and we'll be sure she receives her award at a later date. So please join me in congratulating in absentia the recipient of this year's Distinguished Alumni Award, Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz, Class of 1978. Thank you. Looking down the table there. To say that Mike Scanlon has done a great deal for Eastern over a great many years is a huge understatement. Most prominently, Mike served on the ECSU Foundation Board of Directors from 2006 to 2013, and as the board's vice president from 2008 to 2010, and then as the president from 2010 to 2013. Those years were a period of significant expansion of the foundation's fundraising, endowment, property holdings, and influence. And Mike's leadership and vision played a significant part in that growth. Mike was a very credible board president because his belief in Eastern's mission was evidenced by his and his wife Lorraine's philanthropic support that continues to this day. Michael Scanlon grew up in Manchester and graduated from Manchester High School. He received a BA in biology from Eastern in 1975 and worked in a variety of jobs that included fire hydrant painter and laboratory technician at the MDC Water Treatment Laboratory in Farmington while he was a student. He went on to earn a Master of Science degree in Organic Chemistry at the University of Connecticut while serving as a teaching assistant in the chemistry department there. The combination of science degrees helped propel Mike on a distinguished management career in the development of chemically engineered production applications and consumer products, and led him to, a secure, and led him to secure seven patents involving production processes. Over a career of more than 30 years, Mike worked for American Cyanamide and through a series of sales and spin-offs for Cytec Industries, Bayer, Laxness Chemicals, and Chimera Chemicals. His final position was as Global Product Group Manager, sizing and strength resins for Chimera Chemical until his retirement in 2009. Mike's civic and volunteer activities are diverse. He has been making deliveries for Meals on Wheels in his family's longtime home of Reading since 2014 and has been a facilitator for the Bethel Woods Center for the Arts in New York for several years. He collects, he collects antiquarian books and maps and is involved in genealogical research. Mike, as many here know, has also long been a cheerleader for Eastern through both service and practice. He and his wife, Lorraine, sent both their sons to Eastern. Michael graduated in 2007 with a double major in political science and history, and Kevin followed in 2009 with a sociology and applied social sciences degree. And Mike is a devout follower of Eastern sports and can be seen regularly cheering on our teams, especially basketball and baseball. The ECSU Foundation and the university has been enriched by the dedication, intellect, and support that makes us very proud to honor our good friend and alum, Mike Scanlon as this year's recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. Mike, please step to the podium to receive your award. Justin and Dr. Williams, will step Come on the side. Right over here. And let you take your award, take a picture, then you can make this easier. There you go. Hold on. Hold on. The president comes in. Well, this is stuff you can make better, huh? <laughs> Ken, thanks for that um, kind introduction. Uh, President Nunez, VP Ken, Delisa, President Murphy, fellow award winners, generous donors and family and friends. I'm truly humb humbled and honored to receive this award today and I find myself in wonderful company with all the past award winners who served this great institution. I think uh, Frank Parati and Sandra Roth our past uh, recipients. Uh, when you think about service, often an individual serves or provides service to a college or university because the institution has provided the individual with a special gift. Uh, typically that gift is a quality education. In essence, individual develops an attachment or passion for the university and wants to give back. For me, the gift was the education I received at Eastern. Uh, you might have heard uh, Elsa, Ken, and others describe Eastern students as often being the first members of their family to go to college, and per Eastern's tagline, they receive a 
liberal education practically applied. <clears throat> In other words, a student usually of humble beginnings who was well prepared to deal with complexity and change, develop a sense of social responsibility, communicate clearly, think critically, and ultimately apply their craft in real world settings. Well, I think I may have qualified as one of those students. Let me explain. My father left the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry, Ireland at 17 without much money or education to find opportunity and a good life in the United States. Uh, he was fortunate that his uncle had immigrated before him and recommended him for a job as a laborer laying pipes for the Metropolitan District Commission Water Bureau in Hartford. My mom left my Swiss Italian immigrant grandfather's dairy farm in North Canaan, Connecticut as a teen to work as a cook for the Sisters of Mercy convent at St. Joseph's Cathedral on Farmington Avenue. Uh, they met at St. Joseph's one Sunday, got married, then bought a very small house in Manchester, Connecticut. Mom proceeded to have five kids in six years. Uh, needless to say, with one bathroom and seven family members, I was ready to go off uh, to become the first member of my family at uh, Eastern Connecticut in 1971. I think my brothers and sisters can vouch for that. Because three of my high school friends had decided to attend ECSC, I decided to apply as well, so with the money I saved shoveling snow and working at a local pharmacy, I was able to pay for my first year at, uh, in Willimantic. Student loans and grants took care of the, le the le next three years. I started at Eastern Connecticut State College and when Wood Services with the, was the Eugene Smith Library, Schaefer the admin building, Winthrop Paul was the student union, and Goddard was the science building. I moved into a deep purple room on uh, Nathan Hale Hall on Main Street. Uh, we had a lot of hippies back on campus back then. I was pretty good at math and science, um, so I decided to major in biology and I took just about all the chemistry and mathematics courses that were offered at the time. And boy, was I fortunate. Although I enjoyed all my studies here at Eastern, I found some really excellent educators in the biology and chemistry departments and math department who inspired, challenged, and supported me as a student. To name my favorites, I took zoology and biology under Dr. Mike Gable, cell bio and bacteriology under Professor Grace Rebozo, all my chemistry with Dr. Max Ferguson and Alan Wright, and finally, calculus in it with a truly outstanding young professor, Dr. Steve Kenton. I can honestly say that uh, some of the best years of my life were here on this campus. I graduated in 75 with a degree in biochemistry and so I was well prepared to go to, the, to go to grad school at the branch campus up the road in stores. <laughs> with my formal, formal education behind me and within three months after applying to American Psy and Pfizer's Research Center in Stanford and Groton, I took a job at American Psy <clears throat> primarily because Dr. Wright had mentioned he would enjoyed working there. I soon left uh, R&D and moved into international marketing uh, of the industrial chemicals business for uh, Sinemid and later for a number of other chemical companies. I can safely say after 32 years in the global chemical business, I think I succeeded applying my liberal education uh, that I received from Easter. I was extremely fortunate in another way and that while I was at American Psy in New Jersey headquarters, I met the love of my life, Lorraine Scanlon from Wayne, New, New Jersey. She's a graduate of Fairleigh Dickinson and just as big a supporter of Eastern as I am. So I'd like to dedicate this award to her on our 27th uh, wedding anniversary. Thank you all very much.
Thank you, Mike. Mr. Ray O'Briard has been the Chief Executive Officer and President of SI Financial Group since 2004, and prior to that, the Chief Executive Officer, President, and Director of Savings Institute Bank and Trust Company since 1995. He also serves as a Director of SI Bank Corps, is a former Director of Infinex Financial Group, and he served as Treasurer and Co-Chairman of the Legislative Committee for the Connecticut Bankers Association. Rayo was a 1976 graduate of Western New England University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in management, and where he now serves as a university trustee. Under Rayo's leadership, SIBT has contributed substantially to support Eastern through the annual ECSU Foundation Golf Tournament, the Music to Our Ears Concert Series at Mohegan Sun, Varsity Athletics, the university's dual college initiative, academic scholarships, and the annual fund for student excellence. As CEO and through his strong commitment to the community, the SI Financial Group established the SI Financial Group Foundation in 2005 to support the work of nonprofit organizations and charitable, educational, and civic institutions that enhance the quality of life for the diverse constituencies they serve. A few local organizations that have benefited from SI Financial Group Foundation grants include the Ark of Quinnebog Valley, Inc., Covenant Shelter of New London, Inc., the Covenant Soup Kitchen here in Willimantic, Horizons, Inc., and the Norwich Community Backpack Program. That's just to name a few. But perhaps Rayo's most lasting impact on the quality of life in Willimantic has come in his role as president of the nonprofit Northeast Connecticut Community Development Corporation. Just last fall, the NCCDC was awarded more than $7 million in state funding through the State Department of Housing and, Con uh, and Connecticut Housing Finance Authority funding that will help to revitalize downtown Willimantic while also providing safe, affordable housing for town residents. The NCCDC secured $2.57 million to assist in the renovation of the historic Hurley Building and an additional $4.86 million to renovate the Marcella Eastman Curran rental development on Memorial Drive in Willimantic. State Senator May Flexer has noted that the renovation of the Hurley Building is one of the most critical pieces of Willimantic's revitalization and will provide vital affordable housing at the heart of downtown while jump-starting additional redevelopment. There can be no doubt um, that a stronger, safer, more livable Willimantic will have a huge impact on Eastern's ability to attract quality students for years to come. We have honored our good friend Rayo before when he accepted the ECSU Foundation Board of Directors Distinguished Donor Award on behalf of, of SIBT in 2011. But now that he's retiring from a long and distinguished career in banking, we believe it is both timely and fitting to bestow on him the Herman Beckert Friend of the University Award because he truly is that. Inasmuch as Rayo is transitioning into full retirement, he spends alternate weeks at his North Carolina home and then here in Willimantic. So although he was not able to be with us today, we will be sure that he receives his award when President Nunez and I see him for lunch at his next stay in Willimantic. Let's give him a round of applause for his dedication and commitment to Eastern and our community. Thank you. The story of the Jeffrey P. Austin Foundation really begins with the man who created it and whose memory is preserved by it. Jeff grew up in Torrington and earned his undergraduate degree from UConn. It was while in college that he made his first documented charitable gift. That was $25 to CARE in 1960, an organization he supported for the rest of his life. He went on to earn a master's degree from UConn and a law degree from Harvard. Uh, before returning to Eastern Connecticut. He spent 35 years in the manufactured housing business and became a leader and tireless advocate for the industry. Jeff was completely invested in his community, serving for many years as the Man on the Mansfield Town Council, where he was also Deputy Mayor, Chair of the E.O. Smith Building Committee, Chair of the Wyndham Region Transit District, and as a board member and treasurer of Wyndham Hospital. There were countless beneficiaries of his personal philanthropy, culminating in his $500,000 leadership gift that led to building at the $8.5 million Jeffrey P. Austin Emergency Center at Wyndham Community Memorial Hospital. As Jeff's final illness progressed, so did his commitment to turn the assets of his life's work into a permanent charitable foundation. According to his wife, Eileen, he was so excited by the foundation, even knowing he would not be alive to do the giving. He took it as a very serious commitment, focusing discussions on health care in the community, classical arts, education, and women's issues. Eileen, who worked for Jeff since 1990, married him in 2004. She's been a trustee of the Wyndham Hospital Foundation and a trustee of the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. 
but her passion is with the charitable legacy created by her husband. Alina is both powered, proud and grateful that she can execute his legacy. Alina is quoted as saying, he entrusted me to make the foundation work. This trust in me allowed Jeff to let go and be at peace knowing the foundation would be and do just what he wanted to do, improve the lives of those affected and touched by his generosity. The Jeffrey P. Austin Family Foundation has been a major contributor to the Kevin Crosby Memorial Endowed Scholarship at Eastern from its inception in 2015. And in the same year, the Austin Foundation committed to a three-year match of $40,000 per year to four scholarship funds supporting the sciences at Eastern. Gifts from alumni and friends matched by the, the Austin Foundation enabled the endowed balance in, in these scholarships to grow by a cumulative total of $240,000 from 2015 to 2017. It's amazing. And most important, 53 students received scholarships ranging from $1,500 to $3,000 over the past three years. To state that the Austin Family Foundation has impacted Eastern's retention rates uh, while assisting deserving students does not do justice to this extraordinary support. We are truly honored to present the ECSU Foundation Board of Directors Award to the Jeffrey P. Austin Family Foundation and its Executive Director, Eileen Austin, for exemplary commitment and support for Eastern and our students. Eileen, please join me at the podium for your award. Wow, that was very nice, Ken. Thank you. Um, well, this has been a wonderful afternoon. I got to meet so many new faces, and, and um, I really appreciate that. And a long ago resident of Willimantic, we got to reminisce. So, um, well, I just want to thank Eastern for recognizing the Jeffrey P. Austin Family Foundation for our commitment to Eastern Connecticut State University. Um, this started, well, when did, you, when did we give our first grant? To Eastern? Yeah, okay. Someone approached me and um, wanted a grant for their endowment fund. And um, as I was, in the beginning, learning what you can and can't do with a nonprofit, our foundation does not allow that. So after a couple of days of thinking, I decided to um, have them raise their endowment fund, and um, I would match it with scholarship dollars. It's, I'm really overwhelmed. This, this is just wonderful. I'm doing something that I truly believe in, and I believe in Willimantic and Wyndham. And while I do support the smaller nonprofits, and there's a number of them in town that really do help Wyndham, I do know that education is going to be my standpoint on um, how I am gonna help Wyndham. My foundation has done some really remarkable things and, start, and has affected the lives of many. And with these grants uh, going to a scholarship, uh, we are making a difference for, well, some of you know my late husband, Jeff. He and I talked for those three years, and we talked about how we wanted this foundation to grow. And, ah, uh, geez, I wish you could see the light in his eye when he knew how many people he was going to help even though he wasn't gonna be here to see it. I see it. Um, we had a, a vision for Wyndham and we had a dream. And, and this dream is just starting to come true. We want to bring a change in Wyndham and empower its residents so they can fulfill their dreams for a better life. And we are doing that and I will continue to do it with um, my board who, without them, I wouldn't be able to, to um, have the success. They have, every one of my board members have been helpful to me, supported me, 
and um, these last couple of years I've needed a lot of help. And they've been there. And, and now uh, we're going to move forward and we're going to continue to help Eastern because they're doing wonderful things here for education in this area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen, for all that you do. We're all very grateful for all the hard work that you and your board do for the community and for Eastern. <clears throat> to appropriately recognize Jerry, Jack, and Sean Spillane today, we first have to explain the legacy of Dr. Robert Spillane, class of 1956, or Buddy, as he's more commonly and effectually known by friends, colleagues, and family. Buddy Spillane, who served four years as superintendent of the Boston Public Schools from 1981 uh, through 1985, sadly passed away in 2015. But he arrived in Boston in 1981 after serving as New York State's Deputy Commissioner for Elementary, Secondary, and Continuing Education after having served as superintendent of school districts in New York and New Jersey. In Fairfax County, Virginia, then the 10th largest school district in the nation, Buddy served as superintendent for a dozen years. During this time, the district consistently ranked near the top of the nation in test scores. Buddy moved on to become the regional education officer for Europe for the U.S. State Department's Office of Overseas Schools. In 1969, Buddy Spillane was the first Eastern graduate to be honored with the Distinguished Alumni Award. We also had the privilege of Buddy's broad experience as he served on the ECSU Foundation Board as a director for over a decade. Buddy and his wife, Jerry, class of 1957, met at Eastern, married, raised four children, who blessed them with eight grandchildren. Buddy and Jerry were always about family, and that included Eastern, or Willie State, as Buddy liked to refer to us. Together, Buddy and Jerry attended countless Eastern events, showing their commitment and dedication to our mission and to our students. Without a doubt, Buddy was Eastern's most decorated education alum. Buddy took over in Boston in 1981, a very difficult time while the school system was under a federal court desegregation order that required the busing of students. As he worked to implement changes, he became known for his, his candid, straightforward leadership style. During his tenure, he was credited with improving financial management, instituting a citywide curriculum and promotional standards, and forging alliances with the business community. He also had a tremendous influence on the U.S. District Court judge's decision to return control of the schools to the school committee. Referring to the challenges Buddy had faced in Boston, Mary Collier, who was head of the Fairfax County School Board, told The Globe in 1985 that, quote, we had announced that we were looking for a superintendent who could walk on water. What we found was a superintendent who could work miracles. I think that quote paints the picture of, a, of the great work that Buddy accomplished during his remarkable career in education. And of course, the record of achievement that Buddy enjoyed did not stop with Buddy in the Spillane family and was extended to our new friends and, and honored guests, Jack Spillane, Buddy's older brother, and Sean Spillane, Jack's son. We are pleased to have uh, Sean's wife, Deborah, joining this special occasion today. Jack's love for his brother moved him to honor his memory in an impactful way that aligned with Buddy's personal and professional values. I remember the initial phone conversation that I had with Jack and how focused he was in doing what he knew in his heart would make his brother smile. I should share with you that Buddy would refer to his brother Jack as, quote, unquote, the soap man. You will understand that nickname in a few moments. The rest is history because Jack and his son Sean worked with me in the development office and in a very short time, the Dr. Robert Buddy Spillane 56 Memorial Endowed Scholarship was funded by a very generous six-figure gift by Jack and Sean Spillane and Jerry followed suit with another very substantial gift. The students with unmet financial need who will be helped by this endowed scholarship fund will be many over the years ahead, thanks to the generous spirit and love that Jerry, Jack, and Sean, three caring individuals, shared for Buddy. Of course, Jack's strong connection to higher education was well established many years ago. Jack serves on the Board of Trustees of the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. This past fall, he received the University of Minnesota School of Nursing's Richard Olding Beard Award, recognizing a non-nurse whose foresight, wisdom, and advocacy for the nursing profession have led to better health care for all. At that occasion, the University of Minnesota Dean, Dr. Connie Delaney, was quoted, Jack's spirit of service and his capacity to bridge our collective mission to improve health with the interests and passion of many is profound. 
as a backdrop to Jack and Sean's success was the takeover of a small Minnesota company that produced soaps and detergents for the dairy and creamery business that served to clean the milking equipment and the cows themselves. In 1968, Jack purchased the company and began producing home and industrial laundry products, car washes, and waxes. Jack used his long experience having worked for Procter & Gamble and Arm & Hammer to transform the outdated company, and in doing so, he moved national purity to downtown Minneapolis and added a modern research laboratory for R&D purposes. Jack continued the growth of the company through strategic acquisition, and some 34 years later, in 2002, his son, Sean, purchased his dad's company, consolidated the manufacturing operation in an Iowa facility, and consolidated office and warehousing in Minneapolis, and further expanded the business to focus on contract packaging and new partnerships. National Purity LLC continues to thrive under Sean's leadership. So you can see that the smart genes are, not, are, are abundant in the entire Spillane family. The, the success that Buddy, Jerry, Jack, and Sean have achieved has been generously shared with Eastern because of their love of family and strong commitment to helping others. It goes without saying that it is our great fortune to have Jack, Jerry, and Sean as dedicated friends of the Eastern family and of our mission of access for all students. Of course, most important, is that as a result of this wonderful philanthropy, the Buddy Spillane legacy will live on forever. At this time, I am honored to ask Jerry, Jack, and Sean to come forward to accept the ECSU Foundation Distinguished Donor Awards. Jack's gonna make a few comments on behalf of the family. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, Ken covered a lot of me, and uh, um, I want to tell you that uh, I, I thank you for the welcome that you gave us. And uh, I, this is our hometown. Uh, we were born in a house with, where Blarney's is now. And there was five of us. It wasn't exactly spacious. It didn't have a side yard or a backyard or a front yard but it was centrally located. And uh, my father, when I was born, was unemployed. When Bud was born, my mother, just to tell people that that was in 1933, that uh, her husband was in the Roosevelt administration. Well, he was, it was a bit of a stretch because he was on the WPA swinging a pick and a shovel in, uh, in those days in the WPA. So, uh, uh, matter of pride, but uh, he went into, uh, we got to Connecticut uh, in Pratt and Whitney and Hartford. We came to Willimantic when they started a plant here. And uh, after the war, he made a decision to start a little lunch counter, in uh, which is now Blarney's. So uh, somebody moved out of the bedroom and we had like a counter of eight stools. Uh, a couple years later, he decided, well, we need some tables and jukebox and we did that, we expanded. And then we had some booths there. And uh, so Bud, uh, uh, the campus shop, uh, we, we finally just didn't have enough room, even upstairs in the bedrooms. It was storage and everything for the restaurant. So we, my, he built a house at the 149 High Street, which is right down here. It was brand new. And my mother, who totally opposed it, uh, at that time said, what a great idea we had. Well, she wasn't part of the idea. She, was, she headed the opposition to the whole thing. Um, but it gives you an example of, uh, as Elsa was saying, what can happen uh, when you don't have money. Uh, it's nice to have it, but it's, uh, you always remember what it was not to have it. But you have friends, you have opportunity, you have family. And uh, as it worked out, we, we had that restaurant down there. And I think 
Bud and I, after sporting events, you know, we'd have to make 40 hot fudge sundaes and cheeseburgers and all that stuff. And he got to know a lot of the professors, and he was just a, just a kindly spirit and a great grin. I think on your, on your tables, you have the pictures of him, do you not? Yeah, we had those made up, and uh, he, he was uh, younger than me by uh, on, uh, two years, all but uh, nine days. He's better looking, and uh, uh, he, had a, he had a great manner about him. Uh, I am just surprised that uh, the two of us uh, went as far as we did. Uh, Ken covered the superintendencies that he had, and uh, all around the country, um, uh, he, he was known, uh, Bill Bennett, who was the Secretary of Health and uh, Education uh, during the Reagan years, uh, I, I meet, meet him around, and in China we had a plant there, and, and he always mentioned the long-lasting things that Bud did. He was a great speaker, but every word he said meant something. He wasn't a, wasn't a, a newcomer to the game. So his heart was in this school, and um, I, I really thanked the school. I, I didn't realize the deep, the, the breadth of it until I talked to my brother Joe, and Steve Spillane is here, and he's from Trumbull. Would you stand, Steve? And uh, Bud's, Bud's long-lasting memory, <laughs> he's at a school that, that Bud kind of founded and got going, and so his legacy lives on down there. It lives on with Bill Bennett, who every time I see him, he's not the Secretary of Health and Education anymore. He said, boy, uh, Bud did long-lasting things things that uh, didn't last for a month or a year. He did things that last for life. And uh, in um, Minneapolis, uh, and I've been there like 62 years, um, but I, I talked to your dad and find out, is this still a teacher's college or what, what the hell goes on up there? Because when we moved here, I was 10 years old and I remember in 42, there was a bunch of rubble. The, the school had burned down in 41. And uh, I was fascinated because each corner, the only thing that lasted were those, were those cement globes. They were fireproof. That was a good move. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but the, the school was not there. Then the school was built, rebuilt about 42. And uh, Jerry uh, met Bud there, she, and he met her. So the, it was a win-win situation. I could see that from the very beginning at the campus shop when he bought you coffee. <laughs> a, a piece of pie or something? No, just the coffee? or. Just a coffee, but, well, he didn't want to spoil you right away, I know that. So, we, uh, uh, my brother told me, no, it's really got expanded there. So, I came out here, and uh, just before I came, uh, I got an Eastern magazine from Ken. And you've been great to work with, thank you. And, uh, and Joe McGran, if you guys would like to come to Minneapolis, we could have a job for you in our operation, I'm sure. <laughs> You don't have a non-compete, do you, or anything like that? <laughs> but I was, I was very impressed with the, with the school and what the, what the president said. It's not, it's not study for study's sake or art for art's sake. It's go there, get something out of it, and the thing we need uh, are career opportunities, but really, let's boil it down. The thing we need is jobs. We need income. We need, uh, we need opportunities for people. And I think we're on, you're on the right track here. I was very impressed with, with, uh, with Elsa, the way she uh, mentioned the direction of the school. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. And you've covered all the jobs that he had in Boston. Was I still get asked about that by people, that your brother straightened out Boston in the busing days. In the Fairfax, that was a large system, 160,000 kids. Imagine herding that many cats uh, at, in, a, in a district. So he did a great job there. But I, I want to uh, end up with on Sundays, because I've been in Minneapolis for a long time, and I'm 85, and at my age, you read a lot about your friends that have passed on. Well, there's a poem out there uh, that the newspaper puts in, and it says, uh, do not weep for me, I am not there. Well, you can't weep for a guy like Bud because he's still in Fairfax, yeah. Boston. He's still in this school. Yeah. His, his things, things go on and on. So it's, it's good to have a brother like that. Um, I thank my folks for 
sticking with us. And of course, they were supposed to make the income, not us in those days. But uh, it's, it's, it's fun. I think this is, this is a, great, uh, a great school. I appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for those heartfelt words, Jack. That's very nice. Well, what a day. Uh, what amazing people. What amazing friends. Wow. Uh, to all of you joining us today, including this exceptional group of honorees, and those of you who give so willingly to support our students, thank you. You honor Eastern through your continued faith in the university and your ongoing commitment to giving our students access to all the opportunity that comes with higher education. Thanks to you, you're keeping our students uh, on the path to success that will take them as far as their hard work, their determination, their initiative, and their Eastern liberal arts education will carry them. And based on several of our alum honorees today, there's no telling how far that will be. Thank you so very much for your, for your philanthropy and leadership and for making Eastern a priority in your lives. Congratulations again to all of our recipients. One last round of applause. Have a safe trip home. Thanks for coming and have a great weekend. Thank you.